from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Artemisia's Mirror by Bertha Runkle Some sixty years ago, there lived in New York, in a tiny frame cottage in Greenwich Village, a little girl who had three names. To her mother and her grandfather she was Pet. To her mates she was Artie. But on the record page of the family Bible, and alack and alas, on the sampler her mother had marked out for her, she was Artemisia van der Hooven. In defiance of her Dutch name, she was dark-eyed and dark-haired, quick and graceful in her motions as a kitten, quick, too, in her temper, impatient, restless as quicksilver, fond of playing with boys, hating everything quiet and dutiful. Such was the child who was set down on summer afternoons to record in weary stitches with a fine disregard of rhythm that... Artemisia van der Hooven is my name, America is my nation, New York is my dwelling place, and Christ is my salvation. And furthermore, as if one stanza were not enough for mortal flesh to toil through, when I am dead and in my grave and all my bones are rotten, I leave these verses after me that I be not forgotten. It was Pet's miserable conviction that she should be in her grave before the very first line of the memorial was finished. So many times did the silk tangle and break, the needle rust in the little hot fingers, or the scissors take to themselves wings and fly away. Three times during the progress of that first line did her relentless mother make Pet rip out every stitch, nor was the appearance of the sampler improved when used for wiping away tears. The only drop of sweet and pet's bitter cup was that sometimes on very hot days when there was not a breath of air in the little house she was allowed to take her sewing out into the garden where grand sir worked them on his lilacs and may roses his tulips and hyacinths his heart's ease and london pride the garden was a haven of peace for grand sir never admonished one on the contrary he he often seemed to forget one's presence but to be forgotten was so far preferable to being remembered too strenuously that Pet had no fault to find with him. She was his hot champion against all criticism, none the less ardent that the chief criticism, her mother's, was all unspoken. Never had Pet heard her mother say an unkind word of Grand Sir. Yet, with a keen intuition of childhood, she divined her mother's disapproval of his queer ways his continual pottering over the flowers, his Indian-like silences. This tacit reproach it was impossible to combat, but when her playmate, Millie Kennedy, once said that her father said that old Mr. Vanderhoeven was cracked, Pet though by no means sure what cracked meant, slapped Millie, pulled her hair, and drove her home weeping. Pet was no Griselda. Grandsir was trimming the box hedges one afternoon, Looking, as he moved slowly about, a silent, bowed figure with long white beard and shining shears, rather like Father Time himself. Pet, sitting with her workbox on the step of the great barber, was moved to help him. With her own little scissors she began snipping off box leaves, till the scissors, catching on a stiff twig, they flew out of her hand into the heart of the hedge. Pet jumped up to rescue them, went over the workbox, its spools and skeins and needle books and emery tape measure all rolling about in the flowers and grass. She stamped her feet with rage, then creeping about on her knees to pick up her work, she stained with loam the front of her white frock. Her one white frock had been put on 
to go to Millie's house to supper, and now Mother would never let her go. Unless, perhaps, she should work so much and so diligently all afternoon that Mother would forgive her. With a fever of desperation, she bent over her sampler. Presently, Grandsir came nearer. Pet looked up and smiled as he approached. She always smiled when he came by, as one does at a baby. And now, for a miracle, Grandsir withdrew himself from the land of dreams, where he walked alone, and put his hand on her flushed brow and said, What's the matter with Grandsir's pet? She would not tell him about the frock, for she knew she should cry, and lose time from the sampler, so she burst out. I hate my name. Artemisia, said Grandsir softly, puzzled wise. Artemisia Vanderhoeven, cried that young person in accents of wrath. Twenty-one letters to work. Look at Mother's little name, Jane Platt. Why didn't they call me Jane? Artemisia? I hate Artemisia. But her name was Artemisia, said Grandsir gently. My grandmother's? Pet remembered the fact suddenly and dropped her angry voice a key. She must have hurt Grandsir's feelings. Oh, day of misfortune. But he was never angry with her, and after a moment she ventured. And did she like her name, Grandsir? She liked it, said Grandsir, and I liked it. The haze that separated him from the world's doings came into his eyes again, and he spoke no more and turned away to his work. But Pet was not done with the subject. The marvel of an Artemisia who liked the name absorbed her. She rose and slipped her hand into the old man's, rubbing against his side like a kitten. Why did she like it, Grand Sir, dear? Grand Sir was that adorable being, a person who never joked. When others gave her an answer she could not understand, cruel experience had taught her to suspect witticism at her expense. But Grand Sir's mysterious replies always had sense in them, if you could only work it out. He was so old and could tell so much if he would. It often seemed, when with him, as if she stood on the very threshold of a storehouse packed full of forgotten treasures, and never had she felt the explorer's thrill more vividly than now, when he answered at length, after a pause so long, that she feared he would not answer at all. On account of the mirror, I think. She paused an instant, almost afraid to breathe, lest the treasure house door close upon her. But he did not speak again, and finally very softly, as one who fears to frighten some shy wood creature, she repeated, The mirror, sir? This time the answer came at once. Selene's mirror, Artemisia's mirror. Did the mirror belong to her, Grand Sir? Yes, he answered. And now a strange thing happened. The old man's placid face, which like the faces of the gods, or the dumb brutes, neither laughed nor wept, broke into a smile. His voice changed with it, and from an absent murmur, as of one talking in a dream, took on a louder, livelier human tone. At least she took it when she came with me. She said no one had a better right. Her name was on the frame. Pet sighed with rapture. The past, the mysterious, the miraculous, was unrolling before her. What did it look like, Grand Sir? He seemed surprised. The child seen it? No, Grand Sir, never, she protested. Could it be that the mirror existed? The mirror with her name, her own name, despised no longer on the frame? It's put away for you, said Grand Sir, for little Artemisia. She jumped up and down in joy. Oh, Grand Sir, when can I have it? I don't hate the name now. I love it. Oh, when may I have it? The haze crept over Grand Sir's face again. Your mother. Oh, no, Grand Sir, the child cried. It isn't mother's. It's just yours and mine. Oh, please, Grand Sir. I'd be so careful of it. I'd love it so. Mother never would have listened for a moment. But Grand Sir, the only reasonable grown-up person whom Pet had ever seen, seemed to appreciate the justice of the argument. You would love it, wouldn't you, he said. She loved it, too. She loved it dearly. She had it in her hand when he killed her. 
Oh, Grand Sir, the child cried, her eyes wide in horror. Did someone kill your Artemisia? The cloud came over the old man's face. He frowned and clenched his fingers in vain effort to think. I think they let him off, he muttered at length. It was a long time ago, I presume, he added with a pathetic struggle for self-respect. I presume I never inquired just what happened. He turned away mechanically to his clipping, but Pet clutched his arm. But the mirror, Grand Sir, won't you let Artemisia have the mirror? He said never a word, but went straight into the house and got it for her. It was a silver framed glass, about twelve inches square, surrounded by a ring of laughing cupids pelting one another with roses. Over the glass was a coat of arms, below another but quite different. On the right, running down the frame, was the name of Artemisia, and opposite on the left, the name of Odardo. But who was Odardo? cried Pet as she took the treasure into her eager hands. Then, bit by bit, day by day, the story of the mirror was revealed. Somewhat to her surprise, Pet was allowed to keep the clear possession. Her mother feared it would make her a very vain little girl. But, said honest Pet, to whom had never occurred the notion of using Artemisia's mirror to look at herself in, I don't care about it because it's a looking glass. I care about it because it has my name on it. And her mother, seeing the child hug it in her arms, had not the heart to take it away. Now where the sowing hours, hours of joy, Pet would take her little chair into the garden, plant it close to whatever flower bed was absorbing Grand Sir, sit down with a sacred mirror on her knees. For all her heedless ways, she never quite scratched or dented it, and ply the old gentleman with questions. And from what he told, and what her mother knew, and what later her own imagination supplied to her, she constructed the history of the mirror. About 1527, I suppose, at all events, when the question of King Henry VIII's divorce was first broached, and the king and his holy father at Rome were the best friends in the world, a certain young courtier named Edward Sutton was dispatched to the Vatican to breathe privily into Clement's ear moving account of His Majesty's sufferings by reason of his unchurchly marriage. That he, Edward, accomplished much for his master, history does not show, but he did very well for himself when he married the beautiful and heiress Artemisia Visconti. Jewels and plate and gold coin he carried back to England in his wife's coffers, and dearest to Artemisia of all her gear, her father's gift the mirror. The glass was dull to be short and flawed here and there, like a pond on a gusty day, for mirror making was an infant industry then, carried on with infantile skill. But Artemisia, never having seen better, was quite satisfied. And who indeed would think of defects in the glass? When Cellini had made the frame, Artemisia never went from London to Sutton House. The Dominican priory, which the king had wrenched from the monks for his favorite Sir Edward, without the loved mirror. It was unpacked and placed in her bedchamber, even at the roadside inns where she passed the night, and in the morning packed again, oh so carefully, and strapped to my lady's own saddle for the next day's ride. The mirror hung, very epitome of worldliness, on the great priory wall, where never mirror had hung before and watched all the junketings of the idle triflers that passed before it. The old walls that never since their building had beheld aught but black-gowned monks at their somber duties and bare reflections must have looked in horrified amaze on the feasts, the games, the dancing, the grave plumage of women and men. But the mirror, born like its mistress in mirth-loving Italy, beamed approval. From its high place, like a king on his days, it presided over mask and rout, and gave smiling sanction to all. It felt doubtless, how should a mirror guess otherwise, that all passing and repassing before its glass, all actions within its sight, were but a pageant arranged for its pleasure. Like the king in his box at the play, it graciously rewarded the actors by giving back smile for smile, 
when the peace was gay, and sympathetic frowns when lowering tragedy showed her face. And greatest tribute of all, the mirror paid the players the courtesy of unflagging attention. Day in, day out, season by season, year by year, be the peace gay or be the peace dull, absorbing drama or various farce, the mirror with unwearied patience watched, watched, always watched. All the days of her life it watched the Lady of Sutton, and when at length the name of Artemisia Visconti was carved beside the English Cates and Elizabeth and Sutton Church, it watched her children. It almost forgot Benvenuto's workshop or Artemisia's bridal chamber overlooking the Tiber. So overlaid were those pictures by the swift, changing visions of the Priory. For two hundred years and more, the mirror hung in the great hall, reflecting marriage feast and funeral breakfast, peace and war, retinues of Tudor, Stuarts, Brunswicks. It nearly lost its Priory home under Catholic Mary, only to have its right confirmed by Protestant Elizabeth. It saw the stately first Charles, when once he spent a night at Sutton House. What did it not see? It was hidden in the cellars, lest it should be seen. Was the nag of a roundhead trooper, tied to the very hook where it itself had hung so long. But at length the land was at peace again, and Cellini's mirror took its old proud place. Where had it been for a hundred years? There it remained for a hundred more, and ought, so the Sutton of her, to be hanging today. But we Vanderhoevens hold otherwise. We maintain that the mirror is ours, on stronger testimony than that of the Sutton's, the mirror's own. At the beginning of the last century, there dwelt in Sutton House another Artemisia. Dark-haired she was, like her remote ancestress, with a clear skin, flushing and paling as she talked, and brown eyes looking out eagerly on life, demanding of it something more than the pompous comfort to which she had been born. A summer in London, a winter in Bath, marriage with a neighboring squire, servants to manage, tenants to patronize, the still room to order, music to copy, and accounts to keep. These satisfied her sisters, but Artemisia, lying wide-eyed in bed over the nights, had dreams of a wider world. The moment was ripe for the fairy prince, and lo, he appeared. His name was Hendrik van der Hooven, and he came from the United States of America, from a place bearing the extraordinary name of Schenectady. He was han handsome, a gentleman's son, but above all, he was different. This difference was his conquering charm, assisted by the fact that from a parent's point of view, he was utterly ineligible. In the first place, he came from the rebellious colony where hardly thirty years before the Earl of Sutton's regiment had suffered grievous rout, the recollection of which stung Lord Sutton even now, and besides rumors of a new war filled the air. To the deadly crime of being an American, Hendrick added the unforgivable sin of being a younger son. In Lord Sutton's opinion, human depravity could no further go. The sobbing Artemisia, told that her family blushed for her, retorted, that they need not blush for her long. This was interpreted to be a threat of dying of a broken heart and was poo-pooed accordingly. The family mistook Artemisia. One midnight a little figure clad in a kitchen maid's homespun gown stole from stair to stair with a lightness of tread no kitchen maid ever attained. The hobnailed shoes were in one hand and the other she carried tied together in a stout gray shawl those worldly possessions which she had thought suitable to begin with her new life on the new continent. Fifty years afterward, the man who had awaited her in the garden that night named over to her granddaughter every article that the English Artemisia carried in her shawl. The little garden in Christopher Street was as like as love and pains could make it to the great garden at Sutton House. Hendrik van der Hoeven who could not remember on Sunday the thing you had told him on Saturday, yet remembered every turn of the walks in Sutton House Garden, and what flowers grew in every bed. He would forget his breakfast, if Pet did not lead him to his place. But he knew, after fifty years, 
the fashion of Artemisia's trousseau. First the skimp white satin gown in which she had been presented at court, and in which she hoped to conquer the hearts of her new and formidable kinsfolk, the feathered turban, the mitts, the silk stockings, and white sandals. Then her prayer book and Belinda Daphne, the doll given on her third birthday, and her gold neck chain and locket with her mother's picture in it, and a curl of her bosom friend, Lady Betty Arminster's hair, and a copy of the Gentleman's Magazine for February 1811, containing an address and rhyme to Miss A.S. on her arrival in Bath, and a watercolor of Sutton House, executed by herself with much assistance from her drawing master. Also four pounds, seven and four pence, in gold and silver, her India shawl that her Uncle William had brought her from Calcutta, and a stuffed paroquet from the same source which all through her childish years had been Belinda's rival in her deepest affections. She was afraid Hendrick might laugh at Belinda and the paroquet, but she could not steal her heart to the parting. Last of all, this practical young person insured Hendrick's and herself from starvation on the road to Gretna by providing half a loaf of plum cake. Thus equipped, she felt herself competent to face stormy seas and even a stormy father-in-law. But as she stood in the little back hall with her hand on the latch of the window, she came to a sudden pause, then putting down her shoes and bundle, felt her way along the walls to the door at the end of the passage. Down another quarter she groped her noiseless way and out into the old hall where the monks had eaten their black bread and lentils and straight to the spot where hung Artemisia's mirror. For one moment she hesitated, conscience warring with desire, but when Hendrick rose from behind the holly bush to seize her, she panted. There, take that, and thrust the mirror into his hands. It was rightly hers, she argued, since it bore her name. In the fair sweet evening at sea as a ship sailed into the sunset, she confided to Hendrick how she sometimes fancied herself that same Artemisia for whom the mirror was wrought, and who so long ago bore it when a bride over strange seas to her husband's home. In pursuit of the fancy, she loved to call Hendrick Odardor, or Sir Edward Knight of St. George. That early time was what Grand Sir loved best to talk about. Nor could Pet draw from him any but a vague and confused account of later happenings, of how the young couple had gone to his father's home in Schenectady, and then to Hendrick's farm further to the west, where they built a fair brick house and named it Sutton House, and laid out terraces and gardens after those at the old home in England. And there Pet's father was born, and his mother called him the little lord of the manor. Why don't we live there now, Grand Sir, was Pet's natural question. Grand Sir's face clouded pitifully, and slow tears filled his old eyes, while he answered pitifully that he didn't know. Dirk had driven him away. But how could Dirk drive you and Grandmother away? The child persisted. She was dead, said the old man. Artemisia was dead. He began to cry hopelessly, and Pet climbed on his knees and comforted him and asked him no more questions. But she asked her mother, who was Dirk? Has your grandfather been talking to you about Dirk? Mrs. Vanderhoeven answered, a little startled, it seemed. I never heard him so much as mention Dirk's name. I thought he'd forgotten. Dirk was his twin brother. He says Dirk drove him from his home, Pet cried. I'll tell you the whole story, Artemisia, her mother said. You're old enough to hear it now, and you couldn't understand it from Grand Sir. Pet, with a fearful joy, composed herself to listen, fearful, for she knew the story concerned her grandmother's death, and her grandmother was killed. Grand Sir had said, joyous, with a joy of childhood and stories and mysteries. Your grandfather's house, Sutton House, Pet murmured to herself, was burned down. One of the farm's hands, his name was Edward Day, set it on fire for spite. Madame Vanderhoeven ran into the house to save her mirror, that very mirror you make so much of, and she was burned to death. My grandmother Artemisia, whispered Pet aghast. Yes, poor thing, she was so young too, 
no more than thirty, and your father used to tell me often how pretty she was. He was ten years old at the time, and he remembered her well. He used to say you'd grow up her very image. Was that why Grandsir left the farm, Mother? He had to go, for it wasn't his any longer. His father died in Schenectady only two days after the fire, and then it turned out that the title deeds that gave your grandsir all his lands had been burnt in the fire. It seems that your great-grandfather had to leave Hendrick his share of the land in his will, but he deeded it to him earlier, when your grandfather brought his wife home. I presume Hendrick was the favorite son, and your grandfather always was kind of high-flown and heedless, and he never had the deeds recorded, as they call it. But when the father gave the papers to him, he threw them straight into his wife's lap and said, Take care of them, Artemisia, that's your fortune. And she kept them, and he never took the trouble to know where they were, so they went up in smoke. So then Dirk got the place, because his father's will left him everything not already disposed of. But mother, the place wasn't Granser's father's, it was Granser's, little Artemisia cried. Yes, but the papers to prove it were burnt said her mother with a calm of long submission. Artemisia in tears was jumping up and down with excitement over unbearable wrong. But didn't everybody know it was Granser's? Didn't Dirk know? Why didn't Granser tell him? She sobbed. Oh, bless you, child. Dirk knew, and everybody knew. But the law wouldn't give your grandfather the place without the papers. He had no proof at all, so Dirk took it. It was the best land in your grandfather's estate. And Dirk had always been mad, so your father said, because Hendrick got it. He didn't offer to give it back once he got it. Dirk didn't, and your grandsir and your father were turned out like beggars. Is Dirk alive? Pet asked with visions of a just God striking him dead, like an Ananias for his iniquities. But her mother answered, Oh dear, yes. He comes to town every winter and lives in one of the biggest houses in Lafayette Place. They're rolling in money while your father clerked it all his days. But he'd sooner have starved than go to Dirk Vanderhoeven for help. But don't we have any money at all, Mother? Pet asked. We've got what I earn, her mother told her. Then there's the house and a little besides. I couldn't take care of the three of us all by myself. But I make every cent I can sewing. Your father couldn't say, I don't try my best. Thus, Pet's first glimpse into the ways of the great world left her with a profound contempt for that machine of injustice known as the law, a Montague and Capulet hatred of the Lafayette place Vanderhoevens, and a quite new respect for her hated needle. That mother worked to support her and grandsir had never occurred to her. Food was spread thrice a day, she had never questioned any more than Tim the cat whence it came. But now to help mother because her ardent ambition, the little devil that knotted the thread and ran off with a thimble, was exercised and triumphantly cast out. Till on one proud day her mother said, I do declare, Pet, you're a better hand with your noodle, needle than I am. Pet was eighteen now, pretty and fresh and gay working hard to ease mother but finding time for play too brooding little over the lost glories of her line but finding life was pleasant to pet vanderhoeven of the little cottage as it could be to her cousins the young ladies of lafayette place grand sir was older feebler even more silent when she went out as she often did to help his ineffective hands in the garden there were no more stories of artemisia save that he would sit for hours with the mirror in his hand. Pet could think that he had forgotten all, as she herself had well nigh forgotten, in the busy interest of her young life. Then came the day when her mother fell ill. A slight cold, a mere nothing, they, tho they thought it, but in three days she was dying. Toward the last, her eyes dwelt in a frightened way on Pet, and she seemed to long to speak but could not, and passed in silence. Her going left Pet stunned with misery, but the ill fates had not done with her. The day her mother was buried came the lawyer, through whom Mrs. Vanderhoeven's little income had been paid, 
to tell Pet that Mr. Vanderhoeven continued the free tenancy of the house and the same allowance he had paid her mother. My grandfather? Pet ejaculated completely at a loss. Your great uncle, Mr. Dirk Vanderhoeven. To her look of speechless amaze, he went on. Didn't you know, Miss Vanderhoeven, that Mr. Dirk Vanderhoeven had made your mother an allowance of twenty dollars a month ever since your father's death fifteen years ago? Out of our own estate, the magnificent fortune of twenty dollars a month? Pet blazed forth. Convey my compliments, if you please, to Mr. Dirk Vanderhoeven, and inform him that I have learned for the first time of his generosity and that from this hour declined to be a beggar on his bounty. My dear Miss Vanderhoeven, the lawyer protested, think what you are doing. I do think, Pet retorted, that as a matter of fact, she did not. She only felt. I know what I am doing. I know Grandsor, and I would rather starve than accept one penny from Mr. Dark Vanderhoeven. The money he has given us shall all be paid back, and he may rest assured I have no more to say to you, Mr. Cheever. When Pet assumed the air that had won her grandmother the name of the haughty madam, there was indeed no more to be said. The very next day she and Grandsire were installed in two rooms, in the very eaves of a narrow house in Bleecker Street, and Mr. Dirk Vanderhoeven was richer by two hundred and forty dollars a year. Heroism is seldom comfortable for the hero, my dears, but it is likely to bear even harder on the hero's family. Poor Grandsir could by no means understand why he must leave his garden plot, his work of fifteen years. He wept like a wrong child, and with the child's obstinacy clung by main force to the arbor post and declined to budge. In despair, Pet told him they must go, because the house was Dirk's. Instantly, Grandsir's lamentation ceased, while there came into his face both fear and cunning a look even more pitiable than his tears. We must go, child, we must go this minute, he cried, clutching Pet's arm and peering round to see if perchance Dirk were lurking near. We must go before Dirk finds us. He drove us away from Sutton House. He'll drive us out of the country if he can. In the new abode for weeks after, every time a board creaked, a step sounded in the hallway. Grandsir cringed and whispered, Dirk. Pet's heart nearly broke for pity, but she was powerless to lay the ghost of the past she had raised. Fortunately, it was the depth of winter, so that Grandsir did not pine to be out in his garden, but was content with the pots of geraniums and pinks that Pet had brought from the old house. Also, like a child with a love toy, he played more and more with the mirror. Hour by hour, he would rub up to highest luster its shining frame. Hour by hour, he would sit motionless, gazing into its great depth, and he told Pet that he could see Artemisia in the mirror, that she lived there, and when he was all alone she would come out of the glass and speak to him. It was a pretty fancy, and Pet rejoiced to see that it made Grand Sir happy. He talked again, and more than ever, of Artemisia, till her young grandmother seemed to Pet like one of the girls she knew. So familiar and real had her personality grown. Her presence filled the room, she seemed sometimes more alive than the two living beings who dwelt there. Pet, indeed, felt herself by the ghost of her brilliant, wilfer, triumphant namesake. All day long and all the evening she sewed, 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 for not only must she and Grandsir be kept respectable, but she must pay back that twenty dollar a month owed for fifteen years, a Herculean task, truly, but to it Pet set her slender strength with all the spirit of a Hercules. Her life was a lonely one enough, for she could not spare time for visiting, but it was not unhappy. She was strung too keenly to her purpose to mind poverty or loneliness. She had no thought at all of herself. Her life knew only two motives. Dirk Vanderhoeven must be paid off, and Grandsir must be kept happy. For Grandsir's sake, she put aside her work one spring day, and leaving him in the care of a kindly neighbor, went out into the country even as far as 50th Street to dig him violets. She was tired out and the big market basket weighed a ton by the time she had trudged back to her own door. She set the basket down on the lowest step 
and sighed as she thought of the steep stairs. It was even at this moment that the hand of fate shoved toward her a young man who had recently come to lodge in the room next to Grancer's. He was a nice-looking young man whose eyes had a habit of following Pat. Mayn't I carry up your basket? He now besought, hat in hand. Oh, thank you, sir, but it is very heavy, Pat protested ingeniously. The young man's bashfulness vanished before her confusion. Then I must certainly carry it, he replied. On the way up, Pet lifted the wet papers and showed him her treasures. He asked where they came from, and she described her ramble. He remarked that he had seen her several times before. She answered carelessly that she thought she had seen him. She had encountered him on the stairs no longer ago than that morning. By the time they reached her door, he had confided to her that he was a banker's clerk, and his name was Eric Parker. Pet, standing on the threshold, lifted her shy eyes to his. It struck her that the fear of Dirk's footsteps might be lifted from Grancer if he could be made to understand that it was this Mr. Eric Parker whose tread rang so often on the stairs. "'Would you like to come in and see my grandfather?' she asked. "'Grancer's quite old, Mr. Parker, and he doesn't always understand very well. "'But you won't appear to notice it?' Eric promised eagerly, and she presented him to my grandfather. "'Grancer, when visitors came,' had the one formula whether to a stranger to a friend of twenty years. I don't know you, do I? Yes, Grancer, it's Millie Kennedy, Pet would say. Then Grancer would observe were there the crudence of former gallantry. If you come oftener, my dear, I should know you better. But a moment later he would reiterate helplessly, I don't know you, do I? He looked not at Eric Parker in his old puzzled way. Then came a difference. He spoke with a conviction. I've seen you before. Very likely, sir. I live in the house, Eric answered politely, though for all chances of being seen by Grandsor, who never left his room, he might as well have lived in Kamachka. Why, of course I know you. You work on my farm, was Grandsor's amazing remark. No, Grandsor, interposed Pet. Mr. Parker lives in New York. He was never on the farm. I beg your pardon, sir. I must have confused you with someone else, the old man apologized. A very natural mistake, I'm sure, sir, said the courteous young man when the subject was dropped. But the next time Eric came, which was the following evening, Grand Sir hailed him instantly as a messenger from the farm and asked how deep the snow was in the country and how the stock were getting through the winter. And Eric, sitting down by the old man, fell into the game answering as best he could all Grancer's eager questions and inventing volumes of misinformation about the farm. That was very kind, Pet said to him in a low voice when he bade her good night. It's a pious fraud, I'm sure, Mr. Parker. He did enjoy it so. Anything to save you, Miss Pet, Eric answered ardently. Miss Vanderhoeven, she corrected, blushing. Eric started. Vanderhoeven? Are you kin to the Vanderhoevens in Lafayette Place? he asked quickly. Pet was ill pleased at this eager interest in the rich Vanderhoevens. Snob, she cried inwardly, while replying with all the ancestral grand manner. We are the poor Vanderhoevens. We don't claim the slightest kinship with the Vanderhoevens of Lafayette Place. The presumptuous youth declined to be crushed to earth by the Artemisian manner. On the contrary, he was delighted, he said that she was not related to those Vanderhoevens. What he had against the Lafayette Place Vanderhoevens, she knew not, but the fact of his animosity endeared the youngster amazingly to Pet. The possession of common enemies is one of the dearest of all ties that bind, a tie far stronger than that of common friends. This and his kindness to Grancer made Eric ver ever welcome, and Pet even allowed him to coax her out of doors on pleasant evenings. Before many weeks he and Pet, sitting on a secluded bench in Battery Park, concluded that they were made for each other. They had been repeating this with very slight variations for an hour or so, when Eric asked Pet, incidentally, what her name was. Vanderhoeven. The poor Vanderhoeven, she answered, for he made fun of her fierce pride. Never mind, it shall be Parker soon. But I mean your first name, dearest. 
I suppose your sponsor in baptism didn't christian you pet, did they? Not that they could have found any name half so fit. Of course I have a name, Pet protested with dignity, but it's too fine for every day. So Mother called me Pet. My real name is Artemisia. He started away from her, dropping her hand. Artemisia Vanderhoeven? Yes. I was named for my grandmother, the Lady Artemisia Sutton. Pet's voice lingered lovingly on the name. He sprang up, seeming to tower over her. Then your grandfather's Hendrik Vanderhoeven. I might have guessed. But you told me you weren't related to those Vanderhoevens. She rose to something she knew not what was hideously amiss. We have quarreled with them, and we have nothing to do with them. But my grandfather is Hendrik Vanderhoeven. And my father was Edward Day. The man who killed my grandmother? The turf under her feet rose and fell, like the waves in the bay, and the trees swayed like masts. Pet caught hold of the bench to steady herself. Eric, you're raving. Your name's Parker. My father changed his name and left his home, but the stigma followed him everywhere till he died of the shame of it. Your father? Pet whispered as if it were too hideous to say aloud. And you came to me? I didn't know. The name of Vanderhoeven should have been enough. But I loved you before I knew your name, Pet. Her anger melted like mist. Oh, Eric, oh, my dear. He would have taken her in his arms, but she cried passionately. No, no, don't touch me. And then, as he stood chilled by her revulsion, her mood turned again and she cried, Eric, perhaps your father was innocent. Innocent? His son repeated bitterly. He was as innocent as I am. But for all that, your grandfather put the rope round his neck to hang him to the nearest tree. And that's the man, that Hendrik Vanderhoeven, to whom I've brought roses. Are you sorry you were kind to that old man? No, answered Eric, probably untruthfully. But I never would have darkened his door had I known. Goodbye, pet. Her love for him lent her patience that was not hers by nature. Wait, Eric, she said, as gently as the meekest of maidens. If your father was innocent, we'll prove it. What, after forty years? The truth must come out in the end, else one couldn't believe in God, answered Pet piteously. You know, Eric, I've been brought up to excreate your father's name. Then if I, Artemisia Vanderhoeven's granddaughter, can believe him innocent on your bare word, won't you help me prove it to others? His young spirit caught hope. God bless you, my darling. We will prove it. They sat down again then, side by side like friends, while Eric told the story. He knew it but too well. He had heard it from his father many bitter times. Father was the son of a farmer living eight or ten miles from Sutton Place, and he hired out to your grandfather for the harvest. He was only twenty years old, and he had never been away from home before, and he'd never been in a house where the family didn't eat with the hands. The Vanderhoevens didn't, though your grandfather worked beside the men in the fields, but he and Madame Vanderhoeven and their little boy, that must have been your father, I suppose, had their meals in a parlor by themselves. Father didn't like that, and he began to comment on it to the men, and called it stuck up and English and he got into a regular spread eagle speech against the English when the madam came out and heard him. She took the wind out of his sails in a way that made him feel a fool and a booby before all the men, and then she told him he must apologize or go. He went, but he threatened her he'd get even with her. Father said he didn't mean anything in the world by that speech. He was so angry he didn't know what he was saying. Off he marched with his bundle over his shoulder, and he'd put five or six miles between him and Sutton House, when he remembered that he'd left his purse with every penny he had in the world under the pillow. He turned round and went back to the house. It was noon by that time, and there wasn't a soul to be seen about the place. The men were working too far from home to return for dinner, and the women had all gone to carry it to them. He sneaked up to his room and found his purse, and he thought, 
coming down, he said, how easy it would be to take some of their silver or spoil their pictures. But he swore he never touched one thing, but walked straight out of that house and on his way again. When he was about a mile from the house, he saw Madame Vanderhoeven coming along with her son. Father said if she'd been alone, he'd have faced her and asked her pardon. But he couldn't bear to humble himself before the boy, so he dropped down behind some bushes. She and the lad were busy talking, and they never saw him and passed by. Afterward, he wished to God he had stopped her. He walked on another mile to where the road went up over a hill, and on the crest he turned and looked back and saw flames bursting out of the windows of Sutton House. He knew one man would be powerless to help, so he raced along over the fields to the harvesters, shouting that Sutton House was on fire and that Madame was there. While he was saying the words, up ran the boy from the other direction to tell the same tale. He and his mother had seen the fire. She had run onto the house. When the men, father, and everybody came up, the whole place was in flames and no sign of Madame Vanderhoeven. Her husband called for volunteers to find her, and the first to spring into the fire at his side was Edward Day. They were together when they found her lying on the floor in the little paneled parlor with an old looking glass clasped in her arms. Oh, poor lady, Pet breathed. It was my mirror. The fire had spared her, he went on. She seemed to have been suffocated by the smoke. They worked over her till finally she opened her eyes and said the one word, Edward, and died. Instantly the cry rose that Edward Day had murdered her. He had fired the house. In the paneled room, scattered stray, not quite destroyed, pointed to arson. Edward Day had quarreled with the mistress, and then had hung about the neighborhood all the day. Indeed, the boy, your father, bore witness to seeing him hiding by the bushes in the road, though his mother had laughed at him for thinking it. Someone brought a rope and Hendrik Vanderhoeven put it round my father's neck. Nobody listened to a fa word father said. They were like mad wolves in their fury. But when the rope touched them, father, with one plunge, freed himself from the men who held him. The crowd was in a circle around him. He could not possibly escape, and they waited to see what he would do. He went over to where Madame van der Hoeven's body lay on the ground, and he lifted the cloth somebody had thrown over it. She wasn't disfigured, he said, and she looked just as quiet and pretty as if she were sleeping except that her eyes were wide open, staring straight up at him. There was a sort of groan from the crowd when he went toward her, and they surged forward as if to stop him. But he knelt down by her and put one hand on her forehead and one on her breast and said, I swear before God I never harmed her or her house. Boys, could I touch her if I brought her to her death? Oh, Eric, Pet cried. They must have let him go then. They gave up the notion of lynching him. He was tried for arson, convicted, and served his term. I am a convict's son, Miss Vanderhoeven. He was innocent, Eric, Pet cried quickly. He must have been innocent. But after her brave assurance, she shivered. He broke a long silence. Well, Pet, she rose with a strangled sob. I don't know, Eric. I don't know. Take me home. It was late, and her first task was to help Grant her to his bed. She kissed him with a mother's tenderness for his helplessness and put out the light. Then, as if she had no strength left, she sank down in Gramser's chair, in misery none the less wretched that it made no sound. In Eric's presence, swayed by her love for him, by his own firm belief, she had not hesitated to champion his father's innocence. Now, alone in the dark, she wavered. Gramser had thought him guilty. Her father had thought him guilty. Artemisia herself had said in her dying breath, Edward, was it possible all of these, the court itself, had been wrong? Whatever his father had been, she could never cease to love Eric. She could not blame him for his father's sin, but well she knew Grandsir would have no such charity. I would never have darkened his doors had I known, Eric had said, nor would Hendrik van der Hoeven, had he known, ever have received Eric Day. That Gransler did not know, need never know, changed the situation no whit. She should never tell him of what used to open old wounds, but loyalty constrained her to act as if she knew 
Hendrik van der Hoeven's kin could be no wife, no friend even, of Eric Day. It made no difference in Pet's mind that the crime, if crime it was, had happened forty years before, that neither Eric nor she was born till the event was all but forgotten, that Eric and she were guiltless of wrong, young with their lives all before them. Pet had lived all her days in the past. Sutton House was as much a part of her life as if she had dwelt there in the flesh. Her grandmother Artemisia's cause was her own. She could not separate her fortunes from her families. With a feudal loyalty she walked as her forebears had walked. And Eric too nourished on the tale of his father's wrongs. For him also was the dead past a living thing. He no more than the girl could cut loose from the root once they had sprung. They had walked home in silence, despite their tenderness for each other, which no sin of others could kill. The past had risen like a wall between them. They both felt it to be so, and had parted without even touching hands. And yet, and yet, Pet's heart yearned over him. She dropped on her knees to pray for help, for light. Where was light to come from after these forty years? Before her on the table, where Grandsor had put it down, lay Artemisia's mirror. The girl bent over it. In the dim starlight, a ghost of her face looked back at her. As Grandsor said, his Artemisia looked at him. O oh, Grandmother, have pity on me, and tell me. Pet's heart implored. But the face had vanished from the mirror. Nothing was there save the reflection of an empty room. She lifted her hand to push away the glass when of a sudden with a cry she held still. For while the room about her was midnight dark, the room in the mirror showed a band of sunshine across the floor. While the real room was whitewashed and furnished with deal, the room in the mirror was paneled and beamed in oak, and the furniture was all of teak wood. The polished floor was covered with bear and panther skins. On the mantel shelf stood jars of roses. One side of the room showed a bookcase, the other a tall secretary with closed doors. The room was deserted, yet even as she gazed the door opened for the hasty entrance of a gentleman in riding dress. Some elusive yet insistent likeness between the vigorous young face of the cavalier and that tremulous dim-eyed mask on the pillow behind her told the watcher that thus her grandfather had looked forty years before. He moved straight to the secretary flung open its unlocked doors, took out one by one every paper in its drawers and pigeonholes, examined it, and returned it to its proper place. Twice he went through the dusk patiently, carefully, and minutely. With his writing crop, he sounded for secret drawers in vain. Then changing his field of search, he opened the bookcase, removed book by book, ruffled the leaves over, shook them vainly, and put them back. At first his movements had been controlled without haste and without nervousness, but as he continued his fruitless quest, a feverish hurry overtook him. His hands shook. He started once or twice as if at a noise without. The color came and went in his cheeks. In a very frenzy of search he tapped the walls for secret cubbies, fell on his knees to pry up the bricks of the hearth. All at once he sprang up, opened the door a crack and stood for several minutes listening. Then the danger, if such it were, passed. He flung the door wide and strode out and up the passage. For a time the room remained quiet. At length the same visitor came back, empty-handed, scowling-browed, for what had Grandsir been looking, the loss of which had brought that look to his face. For a moment he stood motionless, a sullen, baffled figure, whose despair suddenly before her eyes was changed to malevolent triumph. Abruptly he left the room and came back with an armful of straw, returning for more and again more. What was Grandsir doing? He was mad. No, the mirror was mad, lying. Grandsir was working in the fields that day. He did not fire the house. As if she had heard it spoken aloud, the answer flashed to Pet. Dirk. He had written from Schenectady with the news of his father's extremity. He found the house deserted, and he remembered the title deeds destroy them and he was master of Sutton House. Even as the thought jumped into her brain, the man knelt over the straw and struck a match. A second later he leapt from the e casement, 
leaving it open for the wind to fan the fire. Flames shot up, licking the walls, then smoke rolled thick, hiding all. Pet sat, sick and helpless. She must cry out. She must give warning. But this house had been burned forty years. The smoke wreaths rolled aside as the door opened, admitting a blast of clearer air. Into the midst of the furnace rushed a little figure in a white frock, with dark curls flying, horrified dark eyes, looking straight toward Pet. Oh, my dear, Pet cried in agony, starting forward with eager arms outstretched to save her, and found herself standing alone in the gray dawn, her cold hands clutching the gray glass of the mirror. That it was a fevered dream, she had no choice but to believe. Yet unlike dreams, the memory of it did not fade as the hours went by. The impression did not blur. All day long the vision hung on Pet like an incubus, till at dusk it took her by the throat and forced her to Dirk van der Hoeven's door. Sometimes chance, ashamed of her slipshod ways, rouses herself to outdo the very prince of diplomats. Mr. Dirk van der Hoeven was at home. The servant, a green country maid, more willing than discreet, conducted the visitor straight to his library door, murmured, A lady to see you, sir, and left them alone together. Mr. Dirk van der Hooven was seated near the window, reading by the fading daylight. Pet saw how like he was to Grand, sir, and how unlike. He was straight and vigorous. He looked twenty years younger than the bowed, meek figure at home. Yet not so on second glance. There was no such look of youth about Dirk van der Hooven as still shone from Hendrik's mild eyes. Dirk's face was lined, contracted with mean cares, old. Evidently he had not heard her. But presently some finer sense than hearing told him of a presence in the room, and he lifted his eyes and saw her. He recoiled with the blanched face of one who sees death itself staring him in the face. His speechless lips shaped themselves to a name. Artemisia! You fired Sutton House, said Artemisia's ghost to him. The house was empty. I never meant to kill you, Artemisia. He struggled to answer and fell at Artemisia's feet. She left his own people weeping over him and fled home like a criminal in the night. She had taken it upon herself to mete out punishment to the wicked. She had played at being God, and her punishment had come in the awful completeness of her success. A little crowd of women hung about her own door, which broke into murmurs as she approached. Oh, the poor young lady, the poor thing. Eric, quiet and pale, came out of Granser's room and put his arm around her. He's gone, dear heart. I heard him through the wall of my room suddenly cry out and fall. When I ran to him, he was dead. Eric had laid Grancer on the bed, covering him tenderly, all injuries forgotten. On the floor lay the mirror shattered. He must have been holding it in his hand when he died, Eric said softly. What I heard him cry was Artemisia. Pet knelt and kissed the wan cheek. Eric lifted the mirror to put it in the dead hand when his eyes fell on a folded paper. Freed from its wall of glass when the mirror broke, I, Peter van der Hooven, make over and convey safety's fifty years and Artemisia's merrily, Artemisia's fortune. He was at Pet's side, but before he could tell her, she lifted her eyes, eyes wet for present sorrows, but shining with hope of brightness to come. Eric, he died with her name on his lips, and don't you see she died speaking his? Edward, it's on the mirror in your hand, there. It was what she called her husband for his dearest name. She wasn't accusing anybody. She wasn't thinking of revenge. She was just thinking of love.